With great power comes great responsibility, and usually a lot of rules, as well as complicated mechanics, hours of character generation, and finally actual play that gets bogged down in minutia because of all the things required in playing a superhero game. But what if you just wanted to roll some dice and beat up bad guys? That's where Golden Heroes comes into play, a long-lost RPG from Games Workshop of all people. This mad musings we are looking at a game where instead of spending hours on your graphing calculator trying to squeeze out that extra bit of combat bonus, or figuring out where to cut three more points to get the last thousand blue whales in your summoning this round, you just roll everything at random and let the chips fall where they may. Is it balanced? <laughs> Not even remotely. Is it fun? Well, I'm Mr. Welch and that's what we're here to talk about. Golden Heroes was actually created in 1982 by Simon Burley and Peter Haynes as an amateur product before being released in 1984 by Games Workshop officially. When people think about Games Workshop, they immediately think about three things. Games Workshop screwing over the squat players, then Games Workshop screwing over the Chaos Dwarf players, and finally not pulling Matt Ward away from his keyboard before he did lasting permanent harm to the Ultramarines, Grey Knights, Necrons, Sisters of Battle, Demons of Chaos, Blood Angels, and finally unleashing Kaldor Drago on the 40k universe. But early on it actually made RPGs. They released Golden Heroes as a two-book box set with a player's guide and a supervisor's guide. The cover art was done by Alan Craddock, famous for a whole host of 80s RPG art and a small legion of interior artists. Say what you want about Games Workshop, they did have an eye for artistic talent. Mechanically, the game is all over the place. It's also quite streamlined for players who want to get involved immediately. There's only four stats in the game, Ego, Strength, Dexterity, and Vigor. Oddly enough, High Intelligence is considered a background rather than a stat. The abilities are on a scale of 3 to 18, so 3d6. Then you determine your powers by rolling 2d6, dividing by half, and adding 5. Completely random. Once you get your powers, you roll on the superpower chart or the background charts. Completely random for the power chart, but you can pick backgrounds off the chart if you want. So what happens when the guy next to you rolls up the amazing Captain Doctor Man with his 11 superpowers and massive amounts of super everything and useful abilities that get him an engraved invitation to the Super Besties Club? And you roll up Blink Weasel with subpar stats and the power of super smell and a pilot's license. You shut up, grab the dice, and play. Life isn't fair, and neither is Golden Heroes. Once you get your powers and stats determined, you calculate the secondary abilities like movement, defense, hits to kill, hits to coma, and your frames per round. The game divides damage between lethal and stun, though it's called kill and coma in these rules. The game also uses a system called frames, which is basically actions per turn. You can only use so many frames per round, and if you perform defensive actions, it costs you frames in advance. The last thing you keep track of is your power dice if you have those abilities, which is the total dice you have in a combat. You normally start with 15 dice, and these power your energy, magic, or psi attacks. You can only use a percentage of them on an attack, there's no all-out damage roll. And the biggest issue you discover is if you spend them, you lose them until you recharge the power dice. The dice refresh every five rounds, so you have to budget yourself carefully or else have a backup attack ready because you can run out of power dice rather quickly. The game also goes into great detail onto your background and how you're viewed by the general public. You can be well known, virtually unheard of, you can have official government backing, and there's a whole host of other different social elements that you have to keep track of. Many of these give a mechanical bonus. If you aren't well known, you get a bonus to investigations because people don't know who you are and why you're looking for them. While a super famous hero with a maximum public relations stat doesn't have to pay for her own meals, unless it's later she was revealed to be an actual Nazi. The background system is highly developed compared to other superhero games. It gives your players a sense of their day jobs. It even hammers the point home that superheroes can't be doing their superhero thing 24-7. If your alter ego is a playboy billionaire, he's going to have to hit up parties and actually talk to his financial advisors regularly. A super famous actress does occasionally have to make movies between putting on tights and fighting crime in Winona, Minnesota as the doughy-eyed Avenger. The game enforces this heavily with its experience point system. Golden Heroes doesn't do XP. Instead, it has the Daily Utility Phase, or DUP. You get seven of these a week, and you have to divide them up between your activities. Chasing down an illegal wombat smuggling operation in Whitewater State Park is 1 DUP. Improving your training in the Pancration or working out to improve your super strength might cost you 2 DUP. You could spend 1 DUP to patrol the dangerous streets of Pickwick at night, only to be injured stopping a rowdy bunch of Wisconsinites from illegally parking their minivan on a one-way street, requiring you to divert 2 additional DUPs to heal up. Which means the making of How to Make an American Quilt 2 gets pushed back weeks, which affects your social backgrounds. It's an odd mechanic, requiring you to actually plan your schedule and coordinate with other players. 
it's mandatory because if you don't use your DUPs on your social backgrounds, they begin to suffer, which causes negative effects on your character's play. The game is meant to be played fast, which is a bit of a blessing for a lot of people who just want to beat up bad guys. Roll dice, get powers, fight crime. More than likely, you're going to get powers that have nothing to do with each other, which can be part of the fun or utterly frustrating depending on the player and the powers. The powers are determined entirely random by rolling on a chart. The social backgrounds are determined by talking to the game master. You have to describe your concept, and then the social levels are set. If you're playing the amazing Recon, who is known for his radar sense and his ability to cook a killer bacon omelet, he might be assigned a publicity ranking of 5, meaning he's unknown on the streets, which is great for detective checks, but also means his financial resource level is going to be a 4 out of 10, which means he's got on hand 30 golden pounds, which is totally average. And remember, this is a British game, so they use pounds instead of dollars. Meanwhile, you look at the doughy-eyed Avenger, who is world-famous, making her publicity rating a paltry 1, but her financial resource level is a whopping 10. So she's terrible at investigations, but she's got a staggering 1,814,400 golden pounds when she reaches into her wallet. It's a trade-off. The experience system is entirely Game Master Fiat. When you want to learn something, train something, or increase something, you get told how many DUP it's going to take. There's no hard and fast way to learn skills. If you have to replace something, there's a chart of how much it's going to cost, anywhere from 10 quid to repair a torn costume, all the way up to 1,814,400 pounds to replace the dough cave if it somehow gets destroyed in the course of an adventure. This aspect of the game is something you are definitely going to want to talk to the game master about before you even roll the dice. Physically, the game's layout is almost schizophrenic. Pages are all over the place. You'll be flipping back to the index repeatedly to find the right section constantly. Related topics aren't always next to each other. Things that players might need to know could be in the other book. If you need examples, however, the game is filled with them. Too many of them. Large chunks of the book is filled with pages of examples, which detracts from reading the book because the examples tend to be several examples for the same thing. If you want a copy, there's not much of a demand for it. I found it on several sites for about 30 bucks. The game was largely reprinted as Squadron UK on drive through in physical form, which is pretty cheap at only 20 bucks. If you want to play a superhero game and you don't really care about balance, it's worth a look. Next up, I'm going back to a TSR classic, Star Frontiers. This was a game that has benefited greatly from people's memories. It was TSR's answer to Traveler. And though it didn't have a long shelf life or even a large release schedule, it's one that people still remember fondly. It's also one of the few TSR secondary RPGs that's never seen a reprint. So how does it hold up over all these years? Tune in next time. Same Welch time, same Welch channel.